Come on, does anybody? Go ahead, Diogenes. Yeah. yeah, so Shahaf, Cody's CEO, has been tweeting about it, and they even made a Medium post about it. But uh, Charles, just to uh, you know, talk about it as detailed as you'd like, um, what makes uh, Jed, you know, Cody being the issuer of Jed, Jed going to be on Cardano, what makes it significantly better? You know, you can talk about the research going into it, how, you know, the methods. Um, yeah, just talk as much as you want. And then if you would like, um, you know, really emphasize how the decisions that people make are really affecting people. You know, it's really, <clears throat> I'm seeing a lot of jokes on Twitter and of course some of them are funny, but essentially retail investors are really getting fucked. You know what I mean? Like this is, they really believed in Luna and a few mistakes from some people have really caused people to, <clears throat> you know, absolutely just be in shambles. So yeah, if you can just talk about those things. Um, Thanks for having me on, man. Well, you know, I've been thinking about stable coins since before most people in this market even entered the market. And the very first cryptocurrency that I worked on was BitShares. And we had something called BitUSD. And it didn't really work out the way we hoped. But, you know, we were thinking about this back in 2013. So this is a, a long-standing thing of can one achieve an algorithmic stable coin? And the reality is there's no magic to the construction of an algorithmic stable coin. Somebody has to take the risk. And there needs to be some notion of collateral that is volatile. And then ideally, if you're clever about the construction of that, you can create an asset that pegs um, something that's ideally more stable, either a basket uh, or a currency that's known to be more stable. Although with the related CPI from the U.S. dollar, you know, it's U.S. dollar is not very stable right now either. I mean, it's experiencing unprecedented high inflation rates. All right, so if you take a step back and you say, all right, given these facts that nothing is complete or absolute, all you can do is, is trade risk around. If there's a group of people that are willing to take that risk uh, for whatever it is and, and they're comfortable with that, then it's a question of how deep is that pool of the counterparty uh, and under what events is that counterparty no longer able to take that risk. So all the time, um, you know, I've been, so I got a lot of money these days. You know, I, I lend money out or do things and uh, through various different investment vehicles. And when I do that, you know, usually we can get great returns, about 15% in some cases. Okay, well, then our number one question when we're looking at these types of things is, who is the counterparty and what happens if the counterparty collapses? You see, and so it's just a very simple question, but you really have to dig deep and understand these things. And so algorithmic stablecoin is no different. It's just the counterparties are assets and you look at the volatility of one and the collateralization of one. And the point of JED was really to say, can we do this in a very explicit way? And can we basically create a design where you have more collateral, usually a factor four, I believe, um, but with the current instantiation, although I'll have to check it, uh, so that, you know, if there's a huge market event, you would need a collapse of the market of, of greater than 50 percent in a short period of time in order for the peg to be broken. Um, now, where you get into trouble is when you try to create anti-grab. What I mean by that is when you do things like go with a fractional peg. That's what basically the modern banking system does. They, they just create money out of thin air and they say, don't worry, it's OK, you know. As long as everybody behaves honestly and pays us back, well, everything will be great. All this money we've created in thin air. <laughs> and say, well, what happens if they don't? What happens if you know uh, bad things occur? Oh, they just simply become insolvent. But don't worry, the lender of last resort, the Federal Reserve, will show up and bail us out. It'll be all be all great. You know? <laughs> or the FDIC will show up and help you guys, you retail guys out. And of course, that's just a crock of shit which is why we've gone from $4 trillion of debt to over $30 trillion of debt. And it looks like we're on horizon to spend more than a trillion dollars a year on interest payments for the debt that we are currently carry as a society, which no one seems to talk about or care about. And it's just really messed up, not to mention the fact that every seven years at this current uh, rate of, excuse me, nine years at this current rate of inflation reported, you lose half your money. Okay, you just put it in your bank. The, the, the digits will be the same, you know, the value on the screen will be the same, but every nine years you lose half your money. At the current reported official inflation rate, I'd argue it's actually more like 20%. Okay, so the, the other side of the story is systemic risk. So when you build something as a, a DeFi protocol, the risk is going to be basically in the funds and the assets associated with that protocol. 
which is a subset of the entire layer one. Now, this at times can create existential risk if there's too much in it. For example, Ethereum with the DAO, which is why they had to do the bailout there. But generally speaking, if if the overall ratio of value in the DeFi versus application versus uh, value outside of it is reasonable, then even if there's a failure or mistake, it's usually localized and the market will clear those losses in a fairly short period of time. It becomes problematic when it's a very sizable amount of the overall liquidity trading volume and valuation that's stuck in the protocol. Uh, and so you really have to think carefully about some edge cases that are, are, are problematic there. So first off, you have to make sure that whatever is written in the protocol on paper is actually reflected in the code. That was the issue with the DAO. It was not the case. Uh, there was a reentrancy bug, and that created tons of problems. So the case of Jed, that's why we spent so much time thinking carefully about formal methods and trying to really prove out not only properties of the protocol, but also ensure that whatever code is generated is easy for an auditor to go through and verify. So the probability of having a semantical error between the translation of the protocol from paper and the proven properties to the code is one to one. It's an accurate, high fidelity translation with a low probability of a latent bug. Now, that only covers you if you assume that the protocol is correctly designed and no protocol can be secure against every attack vector. Protocols come with buried assumptions. So I think one of the things that would be prudent for Cody to do is, is to publish what are those assumptions, make sure everybody fully understands them, and you know people will uh, behave accordingly. Uh, the other side of it is that don't promise people things that you can't deliver on. They're like this anchor thing with 20% returns. It's just like, okay, well, if you guys can do that, why can't I do that with any bank account or asset? Like, why can't I go to Chase and just put my money in a bank and then just get 20% per year in perpetual? You say, oh, well, it just, just doesn't work that way. I say, well, so let me get this straight. It works that way because crypto? That that's just magically going to make this all work because because crypto that's that's how we can guarantee these crazy crazy types of returns and so forth is uh, as your Ponzi nomics, you know and and so that's the other side of this. Don't build DeFi protocols with these crazy assumptions about value. Now you can have things where you get 35% return, 85% return. That's called microfinance. I mean the interest rates of a loan in Kenya are 85% for people outside of Nairobi. Yeah, but you also have to understand that the fault rate is 40%. And you also have to understand that the loan book depth is not very big. The entire MFI market is in the billions. Contrast that with institutional money, there's $300 trillion in institutional money floating around the world that people manage and trade. So there's just no way you could, with that kind of depth, um, approach a loan book like that and get anywhere near those types of returns. Okay, but you can with small amounts of capital, the millions of dollars, the tens of millions of dollars. Okay, so this is the other side of it to avoid getting scammed is understand proportionality and understand the levers that manage and maintain these marketplaces. Uh, so when you look at things like returns, you, if they're significantly above the average of the S&P or bond rates, there's got to be under the hood a reason for that. And if that reason is usually going to be either there's Ponzinomics and it's just a scam, or the reason is you're actually taking enormous amounts of risk. So you make a fortune until you don't, and don't oftentimes translates to a cascading failure where you lose 90% or more of your money in a very short period of time. That's just how these things usually work in, uh, in practice. And Diogenes, what was the second part of your question? I've forgotten. Oh, um, yeah, I guess it kind of blended through. It was just how just the impact, you know, the fact that, I mean, not specifically Luna, although of course it's the recent example, but how the actions of a few people who might not do things correctly can really impact a lot of people, you know, as in people who were invested in Luna, you know, it's at two, like $2 right now, you know, like I'm sure people had yeah. thousands, or, you know, just regular people. So, you know, just like yeah. the impact of that disproportionately, you know, if you could speak about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a great example of what happens when you have these trust sinks is uh, people go and they dump lots of money into these projects and they succeed or fail. And when they fail, the people who end up getting hurt are usually the retail investors. 
um, and uh, the project founders seldom suffer significant consequences. Um, I remember seeing pictures of Mark Carpales, uh, post Mark Mount Gox, running around. He's actually lost a lot of weight. He looks pretty good in a suit, uh, and I guess he's uh, he's starting his next venture. You know, and how much money was lost with uh, Mount Gox? That was kind of the scandal I was raised on inside the uh, industry. And there's plenty of other people have gotten away with a hell of a lot. Meanwhile, you know, the retail investor gets fucked. And most of the people that were putting their money, these lunatics, as they called themselves, uh, were, were basically just told, oh, there's no risk. Uh, you know, you're going to make a 10x every day and look how great this is. And it's just free money and it's just to the moon and getting all this this noise. And now now we're here. And the predictable consequence of here is going to be uh, probably tomorrow as soon as tomorrow, uh, politicians and regulators calling for new laws, new investigations, and a crackdown on the crypto industry. There's probably a good probability that this was actually done by some Wall Street shops <laughs> who are trading. So, you know, it's like Wall Street comes and blows up part of crypto. So the solution ought to be, let's go regulate crypto, right? Let Wall Street keep all the money. But, you know, this is what happens when you play with the big boys. You have a $2 trillion valuation. You have markets deep enough for hedge funds to plan and institutional investors to plan. They're going to treat you just like they treat Microsoft or Tesla or any other stock. And if they find opportunity to suck your blood out and leave your, your desiccated corpse on the side of the road, they're going to do that. So understand, as a retail guy, you're now competing against the Black Rocks of the world, the Citadels of the world, the Rentex of the world, and the others. And they are very smart, very ruthless, and extremely well capitalized and have unfair advantages in the way that they do things. Uh, and so, so just understand that. Uh, and it's just unfortunate. What really bothers me, though, is that some of these project leaders – they behave in incredibly immature ways. I understand there's like, okay, you know, Twitter, every now and then we jab each other. But, you know, running around and bragging about how big your reserves are and how much money you have and how you can just buy everybody out, and how powerful you are. I, I mean, it's, it's an undeserved arrogance. And it's always punished in the end. Always. You know, you very rarely get away with these types of things. It's one thing if you're Carl Icahn, because you're fucking Carl Icahn, and you've been around since, like, the Stone Age. And you, you're you so covered in scars from battles you fought that nobody wants to fuck with you, and you got $20 billion to play with, and that's your money you're playing with. It's another thing entirely when you're a kid who stumbled into billions of dollars and not a lot of adult supervision, and now you're running around bragging. And telling people that, uh, you know, you can do X, Y, and Z, or you can acquire this, and you're managing this fund, and you're making huge grand promises, and like a Pied Piper, people follow you. It's, it's just shitty that our space tends to attract this and reward this and has given so many this kind of power when they're not prepared for it and they're not capable of handling it. It's, it's a tough space out there, and anytime you slip up or make a mistake, it's like you know playing a chess grandmaster. You make even a kind of an average move, they're gonna crush you for that. You have to play a perfect game, you know. And if you don't, you're gonna lose. You're gonna get your ass kicked. And even if you play a perfect game today, you have to play a perfect game every day when you're talking about these kinds of stakes. And you have to have a good network of people to cover you when you're down. It's it's just too much responsibility and too many burdens. And I, I hope if there's any positive for this event, it causes people to take a step back and start asking some serious questions about project governance and maturity and the types of claims and expectations that are being levied, the time horizons that are being levied. And if that, uh, if that doesn't occur, then, um, then I guess this cycle is going to repeat itself again and again and again and again. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Um, I keep listening to, as you say in your video, you know, the old guards. And, um, you know, I, I, I find peace in, in, you know, knowing that what is good will win over time. And I think Cardano is good. You know, life is short, you know, do good things. And I really, I do like what's going on here. And thanks for what you do, Charles. Thanks for having me on. And um, thanks. Yeah, stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for coming on, man.